but please welcome Isabel Castro. <laughs> Tom asks a question, answers a question, <laughs> asks a question. <laughs> well, you know, Isabel, you said this is your first film, but uh, previous to this, you worked for Vice. You you did a lot of short films uh, in uh, in communities of immigrants, and you've described to me before, uh, you know, how you're thinking about doing those to help shape this. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So, um, I made my first film when I was in college. It was about transgender immigrants seeking political asylum. Um, I worked on that for four years, and by the end of it, I was like, independent filmmaking is no joke, this is so hard. And so um, I decided to go into news because it was a similar skill set, doing what I love, but it felt a bit more pragmatic. Um, and I think that I, you know, I eventually learned that it was ultimately not a perfect fit because what I really appreciate about independent documentary filmmaking is that it can feel more subjective. It can have a particular point of view, a particular style. Um, and I think that when I was working in these news organizations, uh, it felt like there was this aspiration towards objectivity that often, in my mind, <laughs> flattened the way that stories were told. So. Uh, but despite that, um, I learned a lot of skills that I think I've brought over into my filmmaking. Um, just about kind of like, you know, uh, in some ways like the discipline and rigor of journalism and especially breaking news journalism and just kind of translating that um, skill set but doing it in a way that feels maybe a little bit more subjective, a little bit more artful. Well, in a way, stylistically, it feels like you're pushing subjectivity in this film by letting Doris uh, narrate her own story. Uh, can you talk more about that stylistic choice? So um, the voiceover in the film was always intentional. Um, I really wanted the film to feel like something I would have wanted to watch when I was younger or something that I watched I already said when that answer younger. before you came here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm sure he See, said I was it. right. I was right that Isabel would say that. <laughs> Tom said it probably in a better way than I even did. Um, so, okay, so we got that one out of the way. Um, but I, I mean, I looked at uh, films like Clueless and films like um, uh, shows like Sex in the City. I just like thought about things that had like really impacted my personal coming of age. I don't know if those references are embarrassing or not, but like they just happened to like really stick with me. And what they all had in common was that there was voiceover. Like there's something about it that gives you in insight into the emotional headspace of the protagonist. And um, I wanted to apply that to documentary, but I wanted to do it in a way that uh, is more often utilized in kind of in a fiction space. Like I wanted the film to exist in verite. Um, and then, like, not depend on VO to drive any kind of narrative plot points. That was like, uh, I think there's maybe one line in the film that drives a, a narrative plot point. Otherwise, it's all just about interiority as opposed to, um, yeah, uh, driving the plot point, which in, uh, from my studying of VO is oftentimes the way that it's used in documentary. Um, let's take a couple questions. We've got not a lot of time, but uh, yeah, back there is a hand up. Can you talk about how you were shooting this? Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, more often than not, um, I was shooting alone. Um, and then, and part of that was, I mean, I do prefer small crew sizes because I think that it lends to more intimacy. Um, that said, the, it, it was not intentional for it to be just me, um, but COVID kind of made it difficult to have a lot of you know people um, in in closed spaces, so I ended up shooting most of most of the film, um, and then we had camera operators um, for two different things. Um, one was when there was like really important scenes, like the reunification. Like I just as a I love directing and shooting, but when you're producing, directing, and shooting, sometimes it's just too much, and like you just wanna make sure you get the shot. Um, and I work with Aura de Hornfeld on those scenes, like when they go back to Mexico to the, um, to, uh, the family's graves, um, and 
and we've been longtime collaborators, and I like, anytime I know I need something shot beautifully, like Or is the first person I call. Um, the second thing that we use camera operators was for um, all of the really kind of, uh, or at least some of the dreamlike sequences, um, because, and by that I mean things like the birthday sequence when she's in like dancing in the uh, birthday, um, and then in the back of the car, um, things like that. Um, just because uh, I, I work with Lisa Conlon, who's a good friend of mine as well, um, and she just has like she's just a beautiful shooter. So um, that's as far as the cinematography. Otherwise, um, Yaseni Tlawell, who's a producer on the film, you know, was in the field a lot with me when it came to sh uh, shoots with Jax. Um, and um, and w you know was a field producer, and we had sound people for again like these kind of bigger scenes, like the reunification scene. So at most, it was just it, it was a crew of four. Hi, right, uh, who's question right here? So if anyone didn't hear, she's asking about the trajectory of the story. Clearly, you, you, when you started following Dora, she was at one point in her life <coughs> had twists and turns, and then she's asking how you managed to kind of connect with Jax, you know, before Doris did in person. So yeah, I, that's a great question. I mean, there were, and to your earlier question, I feel like, again, breaking news background taught me to just like keep going. When like uh, you have a story in mind and it changes, like I just feel like it's something that I learned in the field, which is just to kind of like reorient yourself and figure out what the st where the story is actually heading. Um, I started this story thinking I was gonna travel, go to music, like uh, festivals around the, w I thought I was, I always say, I thought I was gonna be like almost famous, but Chicano, like that's how I pitched it. And the COVID hit and like that was impossible. So um, so that was the first major obstacle. Um, then Kuko and Doris split ways, parted ways. That was another huge obstacle. She didn't know if she wanted to be a manager anymore, huge obstacle. So, I mean, in short, like, I, I kind of just, I was so uh, convinced um, that her family's narrative was so substantial, um, the reunification, that I knew that would be kind of a backbone of the narrative, and then Doris's professional life, as all of our lives, was going to change, and I was just going to kind of document what came of it. She, during the pandemic, was in total kind of indecision about whether she wanted to be a manager, what she wanted to do, but she was listening to Jax's music all the time. Like she was a huge, huge fan. Um, and I just think she was like almost fighting an instinct to be like, oh, I wanna manage this person, but I don't know if I wanna manage. And she kept on showing me her music, almost like as if asking for permission, you know? And I was like, I mean, I don't know. I love her music, but, uh, but at some point she was like, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna mentor her, I think. Um, and I did, you know, I did something which was kind of unexpected and in journalism I wouldn't have done, but I asked Doris, I said, do you mind if I reach out to her first? Um, because Doris as a manager, the role of a manager <laughs> in entertainment business is often just to like shield everybody away. Um, and so it had been really difficult to get in any intimacy with Doris's artists when she was representing them. And so I wanted to kind of establish a relationship with her before Doris came into the picture. Um, and so that's what I did. I reached out um, and told, I mean, I was very forthright. I said, you know, a manager is interested in your music, you're making a documentary about her, and that's how it kind of just evolved. Okay, we can take one more question and we'll uh, move it to the hallway, yeah, in the back there. What does that writer credit mean? Um, writing credits in documentary are so weird. I thought, um, I'm I'm like really I'm I this is this is a topic for therapy, but I have like a problem letting go of stuff and like I in the edit was just um kind of scripting things out on paper and so I was basically writing out the structure, writing out the beats and then sometimes I'd even go in and transcribe scenes and then kind of like paper edit the scenes. Um and I'd had that experience from broadcast news where like a lot of it you like paper script and then hand it to editors because you need a fast turnaround. Um, and I just couldn't fight, fight that instinct and it was like part of the process. I mean, I was also deeply collaborative with all the editors on the film. Um, there's a consulting uh, a story person called Chris, uh, named Chris Bachman um, and he was just, I mean, invaluable and we would just kind of brainstorm but 
a lot of it was like scripted on paper before it was edited in the in the in the edit bay. Um, so that's that's kind of what a writing credit looks like there. In terms of the voiceover, I mean that was a real labor of love and a really long process. But the truncated explanation of it um, is that initially I approached it very similarly to broadcast news scripting. Um, we like were cutting the film, and we were we would identify places where there like where I wanted VO more than often, more often than not it was in kind of sections of the film that had these kind of elevated dreamlike sequences. Um, and then I kind of, you know, numbered the VO and had, I had kind of a skeleton for what the VO needed to do and where it needed to be. Um, then I went through hours and hours and hours of footage with Doris and pulled out pull quotes and kind of started p putting them where they, I felt like those needed to go. Um, I read her diaries, her journals. I read her Instagram posts because she posts really long Instagram posts. Um, and I kind of got it to a place where it was like a good foundation. Um, and I worked with that with Ora de Kornfeld and with Chris um, basically to really massage just like the timing and pacing of it. Then I brought in two writers, uh, Walter Thompson Hernandez and Jessica Salgado. They're two LA-based Chicano writers who I just felt I'm Mexican American, but I didn't grow up in LA and I wanted to make sure that it was really reflective of that experience. And they're also just better writers. Like I'm not, a, a, like I didn't, not a writer by <laughs> trade. So um, they came in and really like built it out. And Doris was in these rooms too. And then we'd go into the VO booths with the script and we did hundreds of takes. I mean, I mean, we must have done over 20 VO sessions. And when it was actually in front of her, sometimes she would change the script based on what felt more natural to her. Um, and we did like m dozens and dozens of takes of every VO line and then me and the editors would scrub through and kind of pull out the best ones. So that was a short version of the, the process. Uh, Isabel talked about a fast turnaround. We have our own fast turnaround here. We have another uh, film coming in. Uh, so I'm sure Isabel would be happy yeah. to keep the conversation going in the hallway. I would just ask you to move down the hallway to the lobby area to keep the conversation. Pre give Isabel, her Thank due. you so much. Thank, thank you, you for, for coming. coming. Thanks especially to Isabel Castro. Yeah, thank you so much for coming.